Hello, everybody. Welcome to my talk, Asking the Hard Questions, Morality and Narrative Design. Have you guys all had your badge scanned? Yes, good, that makes the life of the purple people a lot easier. So, my name is Jana Stadler. I currently study game design and production at the NHTV Breda, Applied, uh, University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. I've got a lot of opinions on a lot of things, and especially on narrative design and the way we use games to tell stories so that's what we're going to be talking about for the next 20 minutes. But wait, I just mentioned a really bad word. I'm a student, so why should any of you listen to what I have to say? Well, for one, we all start somewhere. And the other thing is that being a student sometimes has, it per has its perks when it comes to games. And the big thing is that students pretty much run on passion alone because we don't get paid and we have really unhealthy diets and all that energy needs to go somewhere. And the great thing about that is that as a student, I can fail safely. My ability to pay my bills at the end of the month does not depend on the success of what I'm currently making. So that means that I get to try a lot of things that as an actual developer would cost me and other people a lot of money. So these are three games that I've made in the last three years. And I've picked these three projects specifically because each of them taught me something about, um, about narrative design and the way we ask questions, even if not all of them qualify for what we would describe as kind of a story-driven game. So let's talk about the things that I've learned, three of them. The, one, uh, the first is, branching isn't all that great. So this game's called Sunborn. I worked on that with just about 20 people for 14 work, uh, working days. It's currently still in development, so I can't tell you all that much about it. But the, but the important details are, I was a narrative lead with one more dedicated writer on it, and that about, depending on the time of production, four or five other people making assets for it. It's a sci-fi game. Uh, it's an exploration game. And although we only ask one question to a player, we had over a dozen different endings. So basically what happens in Sunborn is that we have... No, wait, that's the wrong slide. So basically what happens in Sunborn is that we have a spaceship crashing into the sun. There's six people on board. Three are already dead. You can save two. And it's up to the player if he wants to save any of them. So that's how we end up with that configuration of, uh, of multiple endings. And the problem with working on a game that branches this hard on a single question is that it can be really unrewarding. One, it can be uh, unrewarding to the players because they kind of feel cheated, that there's so many options, but they only get to pick ones. Um, and it also can be really unrewarding for the people playing, uh, uh, for the people working on, uh, on it. Because remember, we're students. We're not getting paid. I had a team running on passion alone, and it can be really, really frustrating to work on something knowing that it's going to be optional. Students don't like to do optional work. So I had to constantly walk up to people and say, like, hey, so this thing is not on the critical path, but can you please make it super nice for the one person who's going to see it? And the other thing with branching is that it can be really hard to get right because all options need to feel appealing for there to be a choice at all. So with over a dozen different endings, I had to make sure that each of them feels desirable or, in our case, undesirable because we wanted our player to feel like they picked the wrong one no matter what. And this really occurs in any uh, situation where you have a branching storyline. This is a twine game I'm working on, and it's, it's pretty tame compared to what I've seen other people do with that tool. And still, it can be really frustrating to work on, because I know that everything in the lower half of this picture is optional. I think a player needs to complete about five of those boxes, and I need to write all 20 or 30 that there is. And I need to motivate myself to do that somehow. So the other thing that I found out is that working with, const, uh, with context and narrative isn't all that great either. So this is Human Parade, and I made that with three other designers and one artist during this year's Global Game Jam, so in 48 hours. And it's a puzzle game powered by Arduinos, which basically allowed us to make buttons out of anything as long as we wrapped tinfoil around it. Um, but we only ever played in a very supervised kind of arcade setup. So what happens in Human Parade is that a player is given basically 10 actions, like laugh, or complain, or take a selfie, and they're mapped to one of these weird devices there on the table, and then they're getting put into, into quick situations, like here on the screen, we have compliment the man, and you have 10 seconds to find the right action and use the right button to do that. So granted, this game usually takes a lot of explanation when people first see it. They see the table, they see the screen, and they don't know what the, uh, what the connection between the two is. 
And that can be really, really frustrating if you have that in a narrative-driven game. Because we, when we play Human Parade, we have the luxury to stand next to our players in the room every time we set, up, uh, set that up. That's a luxury you usually don't have in regular game development. You cannot sit next to your player and say, no, this is what that, quest uh, what that line meant. No, this is what you should do. And players need to understand their actions, but close supervi uh, supervision is impossible if we do supervise our, uh, our players too closely. And I've had that happen to me with Human Parade. We tell them what to do. We don't show them what to do. And that's pretty much the biggest sin you can commit in any story. And player choice cannot happen in a vacuum. There's always some context to fill that void of we want our story or our interaction in the game to make any sense. And then the third thing I learned is that people aren't all that great. You can't trust players. You don't know them. So a year before Human Parade, we made The Lesser Key of Solomon. This was me and four other designers. And it's a horror-themed board game played solely by candlelight. So what happens is you're playing five teenagers who summoned a demon. And depending on the role you're dealt, your objective revolves around either killing or protecting other players. And uh, the mechanics are pretty simple because it all relies on the candlelight. There's a demon on the board. If you stand in the shadow, you're dead. And then depending on what your role is, that might be good or that might be a bad thing. And what I've noticed with this game is that whenever we play it with friends, it gets much, much more tense than, it, when, than when it's played in a group of strangers. We had one playtest group where a guy was really happy that he died because that meant he couldn't reach his goal anymore. His goal was to protect everyone on the table, but when he died, he was like, well, I can't win anymore either, so I can just do whatever I want now, and went on a headhunt to, uh, to start killing all the other players. And he didn't care that he couldn't win anymore. It was way more fun for him to do that because it forced him to interact much more. So these three lessons are pretty much what I've learned. And I don't know. Do they really tell us what to do with games? Branching isn't all that great. Context isn't all that great. People aren't all that great. Does that mean we can't tell any stories at all? Because those are pretty much the pillars that we usually build stories on. Well. I think each of them is actually a strength, uh, a strength if we look at them a bit more closer. So let's start with branching and why it isn't all that great. Or as I like to call branching, play a choice. Do as I make you wish. Because pretty much a lot of contemporary games rely on having a story and having an impact on the choices that player makes as a, as a main interaction. We kind of tell players they can do whatever they want in these worlds and that it's going to change the flow of the events and of the scenes, when really half of the time it doesn't. And the problem with it is that although we, uh, although we want our players to be in control, we as developers need character consistency. Our characters last for a really lengthy experience sometimes. We have protagonists that go through four or five games of 20 hours each. Um, in some of the more severe cases. And, at the, uh, and on the other hand, protagonists also serve as a manifestation of the player within the world. So we can't completely control what, a pro a character, uh, what that protagonist does if we want to allow our player to role play, but we also can't leave it completely open because uh, open, then they're just going to flip-flop between two personalities and not feel like a character at all. So what we usually do as developers is really break down our protagonists into keywords, into archetypes, to avoid that randomness and to avoid breaking our character halfway through a cutscene. So as a developer, you would find those kind of archetypes and those, those keywords you've settled upon in your GDD or in your character bible. And as a player, you usually find them in the stats screen, where I can look down and say, like, OK, if I spec 10 points into strength, and I could lift that war axe before, then I, then I assume that I can pick up, pick up the sword in this scene. Or if I spec all my points into charisma, I'm going to assume that people do what I want them to do in the dialogue scenes. And my big problem with that is that once you start pushing these kind of binary qualities into a dialogue system, you get that dreaded, a dreaded little good versus evil bar that we have around Shepard's face here right now. So my problem with good versus evil is not that it's a bad conflict. Good versus evil is a pretty good way to track what your, uh, what your protagonist is. Usually what we do is assume that good is kind of a nice person who helps people, and evil is someone who just does what they please and tries to burn down a few buildings on the way down. Um, the problem that I have with it, is, with it is that we're trying to put a number on it. 
Good versus evil as a, con uh, as a conflict translate into a lot of settings. It can work in a lot of story genres. It can work with a lot of protagonists. But once we start trying to quantify it, although it gives us something useful to work with in gameplay, it pretty much pushes our players to make really strange decisions. And quite honestly, the last time it worked was in Star Wars, period. And here's why. Because Star Wars as a franchise is set up with a very, very clear evil and a very, very clear good side and then a big gray spectrum between it. And every character you ever meet in the, fa uh, in the movie franchise of Star Wars places somewhere on that scale and can be described through their alignment. So we have characters like Palpatine who are really, really bad and then we have characters like Yoda who are really, really good. And arguably the most interesting are probably characters like Han Solo who, who don't quite know where they fit yet or characters like, uh, like Darth Vader where... If you watch all six movies, it's basically a story of him going from one man to the other and then going back. And consequently, we get these two games that basically break Star Wars in the most perfect way by saying, okay, we're going to construct a story that plays only in the middle part, and we're not even going to look at the two extremes in the world. We're, go we're going to throw great character after great character after great character after you, and you have to figure out where they stand. And the way that works in the game is that the protagonist pretty much gathers points for either being a Jedi or being a Sith through the dialogue system. So you pick a dialogue option that says, plus five, good guy, or plus five, evil guy. And the combat mechanics are gated by these points. But what's really beautiful about it is that Knights of the Old Republic was one of the last, uh, of the last few games where being neutral didn't mean you were weaker in combat. If you look at more, uh, sort of slightly newer games that have a similar mechanic where you gather points, you have a scale, and then it unlocks combat bonuses, if you play neutral, you just don't get the bonus points. Whereas in Knights of the Old Republic, the way it worked was that the morality actually guided the resource flow. So if you were very, uh, if you were very much leaning towards the Sith side, that meant that, that using Sith powers was very cheap, using Jedi powers uh, was very expensive, whereas if you were in the neutral, both were about the same price. So there was a gameplay reason to play neutral, not just a storytelling one. In most games, what you will find is the only play, uh, reason to play neutral is because at some point during the tut uh, tutorial, I said, yeah, I'm not going to pick a side, I'm going to stay neutral. And then after 20 hours, you notice that you're weaker than if you picked one of them. And the other thing is that with Star Wars, the system is based on the story world. Everything in Star Wars abides to that rule, whereas in most games it doesn't. And the other beautiful thing is that, uh, that this is actually visualized. Everything abides to that rule, so your co companions have the same scale as you. If you flip through the character portraits in Mass Effect or in Dragon Age, you're going to notice that in Dragon Age only the companions have them, because it's, uh, because it's about how much they like you. In Mass Effect, only the protagonist have, uh, has them, whereas in Knights of the Old Republic, the whole point was that everyone has a scale, and if they like you, you can influence theirs. But they were already placed in that alignment system before they ever met you. So to me, that's the great pitfall of, of games that these days try to, try to ask big questions, but then color code them for you, is that there's never a reason to play neutral. There's never a reason to deviate from the beaten path you picked in the first five minutes. It really is more of a fashion and not a lifestyle choice. And that pretty much leads us into, into our next question also, and context, why it isn't all that great. So if I can't change the world, don't make me pretend like I do. Telltale does that a lot. Obviously, Telltale comes up in pretty much every talk you do on morality and game design these days. And the reason is that all of their games are marketed as something where you have to make hard choices. And because they reduce the gameplay so much, that there's only dialogue left. And I think that's a very good way to do it because it really breaks down, uh, it breaks apart this idea of I need to be strong and I need to have a cool story and just says, no, no, you're, you're strong or you're weak. We decide that for you. You play the story. But still they have their issues. I mean, my favorite among them is probably The Wolf Among Us because it was the only one where just through the setup, it didn't bother me that my choices didn't have any impact at all. Because the wolf among us, by nature, it's a crime story. You know how crime stories end. At the end, you find out who did it. And you can't find that out in the, out in the five minutes, because otherwise there isn't a story. And you also can't change who did it, because he did it in the beginning. So in that game, I wasn't really upset that I, would, that, that I knew I would hit the same key points if I played it a completely different way. Because it was, just, it was in the IP, and it was in the franchise. And still, it fell into, uh, it fell into that hole of the feedback loop that I think hinders a lot of the great storytelling that we could do. Because Wolf Among Us, like many Telltale games, reminds you when you did something important. So it basically tells me whenever I did, whenever I said something that another character is going to remember and is going to reference later. 
And by that, it takes the impact away from the next, uh, from the next three lines that come. Because if I see that pop, I know, like, oh, okay, I'm safe for two minutes now. I can click whatever I want. And it takes the stress out of it by placing specific value on specific dialogue lines. And I think that's really sad in a game that did try to make me stress by giving me a timer to pick my lines. So a game that did a way better, in my opinion, is the Banner Saga. Because in the Banner Saga, you usually get really little feedback on what you do. We're used to giving feedback to our players. In, cont uh, in, contemporary, uh, in contemporary games, every button press, we have to go like, yes, we noticed, you press that button. Everything you do, yes, we noticed, you did, uh, you did something, here's an animation, uh, animation for it. Whereas in traditional storytelling media, we pretty much accept as an audience that we don't always get the answer to a question right away. If I read a book and I read two pages about a, uh, about a character picking which way to take as a, as a crossroad, I'm not expecting to find out on the net next page why that, uh, why that path he picked was wrong or right. I'm expecting that to be revealed in three, uh, in three chapters down the line, or perhaps in the next book if I'm unlucky. Whereas in games, we pretty much try and always tell our players right away what, uh, what they did, what's going to happen, and why this is good or bad. We try to reward them right away, and that's not really how choices work in real life. If we try to make hard choices, they're hard because we don't know what will happen next. And in games, usually, we have all the cards laid out for us. So Banner Saga kind of drops you into this really bleak fantasy world where there isn't much hope left. But it's a new IP. It's a new franchise. It's not Walking Dead, where you're just like, well, it's Walking Dead. I know it's going to go horribly wrong. And I know how, and I know why. Because I've seen this franchise outside of a Telltale game. I've seen it in comics. I've seen it in, uh, in the TV show. I've seen it in marketing material. I think with fresh IPs in the time of uh, well, sequel fetishism of this in uh, industry, we can try a few things because our players don't quite know what to expect next. And Banner Saga does that all the time. I mean, I had moments in this game where I was stressed about every choice coming up, and they come up about every five seconds, because I had no clue when, which minor conflict would grow into a mo uh, major one and which choice would come back a bit later because someone figured out they didn't actually like what I did there. There's no right or wrong way to play a Telltale game or to play these kinds of games. There's no right or wrong way to play a game like Papers, Please. No matter what you do, there's always going to be someone disappointed. You can try and be the good guy and not please everyone, or you can try and be the evil guy and then not be respected by everyone. But one way or another, you'll always wonder. And I think the way these games achieve that is by putting the emphasis on the moment and not revealing the, uh, the bigger picture right away or not alluding to it constantly. They try and venture off the beating path by not rewarding the, uh, the being extreme. In fact, Banner Saga or Telltale games, they don't even reward you picking a dialogue option. They don't give you like plus five, plus here, minus there. It's just there. You take the dialogue option because that's what you do. There's no, uh, there's no big reward in our player, a player pressing a button. They have to find out if there's going to be one along the way. And I think if we strengthen the, conf uh, the context of the choices we ask our players to make, we can enforce that kind of ambiguity in, in the questions we ask a lot more. But still, players are people, and, they aren't, and players as people aren't great at all. So if we look at modern media, I think one problem we have is that there's an infl uh, inflation of physical violence. You look at a show of Game of Thrones and there's a beheading in the first five minutes. So that sets the bar. That tells me what inconvenience or tragedy in this, uh, in this kind of world is going to be like. And that's the bar I need to hit every time now that I, that I want to have a tension peak. So in games we do that naturally as well, especially in RPGs. If a combat system is the main part of gameplay that's fun, then yeah, you're probably going to do some killing in the tutorial. And the problem with that is, is that we run into a situation where every tension peak we do is either a character being saved or a character being killed. And I'm guilty of that as well. I just told you, I wrote a game that is all about picking who lives or dies. But in my case, it was going to be a short game and it wasn't going to have a sequel. If we open the first five minutes of a, of a game and you're already picking, uh, picking these things, I'm expecting to be doing that for the next 30, uh, 30 hours of this game and for the next three games that come, into, uh, that come into this franchise. And in my opinion, there's a pretty easy way around that, which is pitting people against actual people. I think way too often in games, we don't consider that multiplayer games can enable stories too competition or cooperation with another human being has a completely different impact than cooperation or 
uh, or competition with an NPC. Like I said earlier, if I spec all my points into Charisma, I'm expecting that NPCs do what I want. But if I'm playing with actual people, well, you've probably all had a situation where you really wanted that player to play that one card and they didn't because perhaps they were your little brother and they were trying to get, uh, to get you to lose the game. So real players raise the stakes without raising kind of the, uh, without raising the tension that you need in the story because suddenly you have pranks, you have bluffs, you have the joy of doing something nice just for the sake of it. If I do something good to an NPC in a game, I'm probably going to get a reward. I'm going to get money, or I'm going to get an item, or I'm going to get a cute cutscene. If you've ever tried to be the helpful support in this game, you probably won't get rewarded because you're playing with actual people and they don't really care. And still, while I was, ready, uh, while I was writing this talk, I was trying to think about the nicest thing someone had ever done to me in a game. And it was a match of League of Legends that we had lost. We knew we were losing it. Um, and another player kept refusing to surrender just because, uh, because he wanted to play two or three more minutes with me. To me, that was way nicer than anything I'd ever seen in a cutscene. And I've never felt so guilty about leaving someone to die in a single player game either. If I leave someone to die in Mass Effect, I know they're going to be gone for the next 10 years of this franchise running. If I leave someone to die in League of Legends, they're gone for 50 seconds. But they can complain about it in the chat box. And I know that's an actual human being missing out on 60 seconds of playing a game. And I think that's the big issue with us pushing character death into all of our big choices. Is there really a point in me ever choosing the evil option? If I know that keeping this character alive might perhaps at some point lead to a funny line in a sequel or in a DLC or in a later quest, is, is there any point in playing evil when the only way for me to play evil is to completely depopulize the playing field? And I think it's okay to sometimes tell our players that they have to be the good guy and that they have to be cooperative and that they can't hurt the other player. And I also think it's okay to sometimes tell our players that they can't be cooperative, that they have to be the competitor, that they have to be the rival. I don't need to give a player a gun to find an enemy. A ball is enough. And if we go for those more subtle themes, if we try and look outside of the box of, well, Darth Vader is evil because he blew up Alderaan, then I think we can find a lot more themes to explore and to play with and to make our choices more ambiguous than do you kill character A or do you kill character B? If you present me with that choice, and then the next one is, well, do you give your lactose intolerant, uh, intolerant friend the scent with, which, with the cheese or the sausage? I won't think about it much, because I just killed someone 10 seconds ago. I don't care if he eats a sandwich he can't eat. But if that entire game never had a killing scene to begin with, if we play with the smaller tragedies in life, then I think we can find a lot of themes that haven't been explored in games and, and that can help, enable us to do things that haven't been done. So what lessons have we learned? Well, let's try to evaluate the way our stories branch, because sometimes it's okay to admit that this is a fashion, not a lifestyle choice you're making here. Sometimes it's okay to do a game like, uh, like the Telltale stories, where we know from the beginning that we won't change any of the bigger outcomes, but we'll, but we'll make the experience our own through the dialogue options we're given. And let's try and consider a player who flips between the, uh, the extremes. Let's try and consider a player who doesn't want to always pick the blue option. Let's try to consider a player who actually wants to think about it and who lends in the neutral part. Let's try to give them something that advances the game as well. And let's try to reevaluate the themes that we work with. Understand your world first and then construct a story with it. There's certain story worlds, there's certain franchises that work with really drastic themes. Others need subtlety. There's certain genres where you can get away with things that, where you, get, that you get punished for if you're working in a different genre. And please just... Just stop overusing physical violence. You hit diminishing recur and returns on the impact and meaning of your tension peaks. And I think that's an issue when we're trying to tell stories that last longer than the 90 minutes of a summer blockbuster. And reevaluate the single player status quo. I firmly believe that multiplayer genres offer numerous ways of doing really dodgy things to people. Just try thinking about stealing a car in DayZ versus stealing a car in GTA and having a player hunt you down for 30 minutes trying to get it back. So I think modern settings like the dystopia we see in movies or the survival genre that emerged with games like DZ, like Unbound, can bring out the worst in people and the best. And those are the memorable moments that we're looking for. Those are the stories we're trying to enable people to tell. So thank you for your time and your attention. I think I took too long and we don't have time for questions, or can we take one or two?
sorry. Okay, um, you mentioned um, Dragon Age and everything mm. with the morality bar. And the, yeah. no, no, there's a friendship bar. Yes. <laughs> and I remember playing Dragon Age 2. Mm -hmm. um, I had some where I was friends with, others I was rivals with, and some there I was neutral with, but it, I had a relationship with them. I had a whole thing with them, but I was neutral because yeah. sometimes it was good, sometimes it was yeah. bad. But developing for that, how would you do that? Because it would be a third story with that, um, uh, with that character. So it would be extra budget going into it. Okay, so the question is how do you develop for that third option? And well, you just said it. Be aware that if you give me three, cho three choices, you need to develop three choices within your budget. Yeah. I think the trick is trying to step away from a clearly binary system always and trying to think about how can I do something that's in the middle of these things that, is a, uh, that still feels appealing. I think 80 Days did a really good job at it by not tracking two stats but four, pretty much. They didn't say you're good or evil. They said, I think it was patient and impatient and then polite and impolite. So you basically had, uh, you had a slightly more complex system in that. And that, meant, uh, and that meant that it opened up the room for them to do, uh, to do more interesting interactions without necessarily uh, blowing their budget just by branching more. Is there another question? No? Otherwise, I'm very sorry for holding you in that room too long. <laughs> <laughs>